I feel as though when I've put the reference points in terms of how much weight should be gained from a week to week or month to month perspective, it just adds this extra stress that isn't overly necessary for the the client to have, where if they see that scale, you know, exceeding whatever that limit was that we put into place, it very well may not be a big deal. Like it very well could be okay. It's just that by the by the standard or by the numbers it's they're kind of an outlier on whatever the the metric is um and so i've i've found it in in my experience more so lending away from the scale provided that it's not getting out of hand of course um in a growth phase is a time where we can you know, take a little bit of time away from the scale and focus very heavily on the physique photos, the biofeedback markers that I spoke on. Um, and I think that it helps a ton from a mental health perspective for the females that I, I work with because the scale can be such a place of, of negativity. It's very tough to um, have that scale in from a day-to-day -day perspective and see it going in a fashion that you're just not comfortable with. Today's episode is part two of the keys to building muscle as a female with guest Alex Bush. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'll link that in the show notes so you can check it out. Quick recap on Alex's background. Alex is an online coach and trainer who has been coaching competitive physique athletes as well as lifestyle clients for over eight years. In part one, we chatted about the importance of calorie intake, sleep and recovery, and hormonal health for optimizing muscle growth. And in this episode, we'll be diving into other key factors for enhancing female physique outcomes, including the importance of exercise execution, periodization of training, progressive overload, time and patience, as well as other relevant lifestyle factors that tend to be forgotten about. So let's get into part two of the keys to growing muscle as a female with Alex Bush. All right, welcome back to Metflex and Chill. This is Rachel Geiger, your host, and I'm here with Alex Bush. Once again, we are doing part two of our series. What's up, Alex? How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me back on. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back. It's been less than a week, so that's yeah. awesome. Um, we were chatting off air. You started your morning a little bit better today yes, versus last I time, <laughs> um, which is always a plus. Um, so if anybody uh, watching or listening uh, hasn't seen the hasn't seen or listened to the first part of this, we are doing a deep dive into keys to optimizing muscle growth, specifically for females. Um, and so the first part we went through, um, the first three kind of keys that Alex, um, took us through, which were calorie surplus, uh, sleep and recovery, and then hormone health. So we dove into those very deep. Um, I asked a lot of questions. So <laughs> if you haven't checked out part one, definitely go check that out. I'll link it in the show notes. And then today we're going to kind of continue on, um, and go through part two two and go through I think there's about five more keys that we're gonna we're gonna chat about and yeah so you want to just get right into it absolutely let's go ahead cool okay so the next one which is I guess is number four um importance to you know growing muscle and these are I just want to preface this preface this too we talked about this last time they're not necessarily like any particular order they all are very important there are some that are going to be potentially more important for other people versus, you know, depending on where you're at in your journey. So just to kind of preface that they are, you know, in one through eight, but not in any specific order. So today we're going to start off with exercise execution and the importance of being able to execute uh, properly, having good technique, all of that. So Alex is going to take us through why that is so important specifically for building muscle. Absolutely. So within exercise execution, this is something that uh, is going to be kind of the foundation to your home for you to be able to build muscle, where if we have a weak foundation and we're kind of building this beautiful house of, of muscle or your body um, on mud, where you have you know, poor execution, you're going to have a tough time of maintaining that tissue or it be, even being able to 
put those walls up or what have you. So when we look at the exercise execution, being able to take a step back and not getting too caught up in, uh, well, I, I want to be stronger and, and that will come with time. But if you were able to sit and focus on your overall ex exercise execution for the tissue that you're wanting to train and having an understanding of just some basic anatomy, basic um, understanding of kind of what the muscles do, that will help you tenfold in understanding um, how to maneuver the movements and just taking your time. One is going to prevent you from uh, injuries and those different things, but also put you in a more opportune position to where you're able to maintain tension on the intended muscle groups and allow for you to make greater progress while staying healthier and um, just, you know, feeling good throughout the entirety of the process uh, and not putting yourself in a position where you could be um, at just higher risk of, of injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think injury is obviously one of the biggest things. That's kind of one of the things that um, is a little bit more, you know, common sense, I guess you could say. But in terms of, and this is something that I feel like I made just, I guess, a mistake for a long time is I, I went from uh, CrossFit training, right, where it was like, okay, let's move this from point A to point B as fast and efficient as possible because, you know, that's what the sport of CrossFit is, is typically. So, for example, like thinking about people are like, why do they do kipping pull-ups in CrossFit? And it's just kind of an efficiency um, movement versus if you were to do like a strict pull-up. Um, so that's just one example. But when it comes to actual, actually building muscle as efficient as possible, I, can you talk just a little bit to the, to the kind of concept of like, it's not about moving the weight from point A to point B. It's about how you're actually moving through that motion like maybe you can give an example of a, of a movement that you see people trying to move from point a to point b um, where if they actually just like slowed it down a little bit and focus more on the execution and technique they'd be getting a lot more out of it mm -hmm. yeah i think that a good example of this is going to be a romanian deadlift or an rdl so within the the rdl i think that a simple cue and, and thought process within this movement is that um, you're wanting to go through hip extension and hip flexion so the the movement or the muscles that you're wanting to utilize for this are going to more so work in a horizontal plane and so I mean, when you see the movement being done, it's, it's working in a vertical plane, you're pulling the dumbbells, you're pulling that barbell vertically. And so what many people find themselves in a position that they do is that they uh, rush through and, and, and in, in terms of pushing their hips back and allowing for the dumbbells or the barbell to descend and they rush through that component and they kind of bounce out of that bottom positioning to where it's like, okay, I can handle X amount of load. And I'm kind of just like using the momentum that I'm creating and, and utilizing the velocity that's being generated to kind of bounce out of that eccentric and come through the concentric and kind of just like moving through space, not utilizing the muscle tissue, but more so the inertia that's being created. And also the component of just like the joints and tendons kind of handling that load rather than the musculature that you're wanting to train. So if we are able to be in a position where we're working in a horizontal manner, where I think a simple cue is that if someone was to be standing in front of you with a, a table and you're on the opposite side of the table, that individual is pushing that table into your hips you, you can slightly bend your knees but you're not really going to get out of the way so you're going to slightly bend those knees and allow for that table to be pushing your hips back until you find that end range and then to initiate the uh concentric portion or coming out of the the bottom positioning of that rdl you're going to be pushing that tabletop back with your hips and that's going to be the cues that you want to kind of think through in that movement to allow for your hamstrings and glutes to be the priority as if we are going to be pulling very uh, viciously out of that bottom position and we're thinking just vertical, then oftentimes what's going to happen is that a lot of that um, tension is going to be located towards the erectors specifically um, and then putting just more strain on the spine in general. So it's going to be uh, a movement where you want to really think of a lot of the tension through your glutes specifically and going through hip extension and flexion as I spoke to, rather than thinking about that vertical aspect to it uh, because just to the naked eye you're just going to think okay i've got to go down and touch the dumbbells to the floor and then i've got to stand back up and the reality is is that 
you, once you get out of that positioning of, of how far those hips can shift back, we have to shift some of that tension, uh, to other musculature so that you can even continue to descend into that eccentric portion of the movement. So we want to, when we're trying to put on as much muscle as possible, we want to limit the amount of, uh, range more so are more specific to your active range of motion mm -hmm. rather than it just being like, okay, this point A to point B that you spoke to, um, and, and finding where you can maintain tension, uh, within the intended muscle groups that you're wanting to train. Gotcha. Yeah. And that, that makes yeah. complete sense. I like the, the table analogy. One other one that I've heard, I'm sure you've heard this one. It's like when you have, uh, like when you're in getting out of your car and you have like a bunch of stuff in your hands and you're like trying to close your car door, like think about the motion of like pushing your, like using your butt to close the door because you don't have any hands. Like that motion literally one. is like the hinge backwards. Um, that right. one always, like, I always think of that one when I'm like, uh, struggling a little bit. So, but I like the, yeah. the table one too. Um, one other question under this category, I told myself I wasn't going to ask a bunch of questions, but they, <laughs> I, I told you, they just pop into my head. Um, That's okay. can we just talk a little bit, um, about the difference between sensation versus actual tension and stimulus that you're getting? Um, I know there is, you know, I've been learning a lot about this, especially with, you know, doing, going through the N1 course and, and following mm -hmm. along with that. Um, but kind of the, especially when it comes to glute training, right. For females, right. glute training is typically a big, big portion of training, um, or something that a lot of people want to focus on. Um, so kind of talking through, you know, machines like the, the abduction machine where you're sitting down and pushing your knees out, um, mm -hmm. how that might not be like the best option, even though you might feel that sensation, um, or like maybe putting bands around your knees and doing a hip thrust, why that also might not be like the most optimal um, thing to do, even though you might feel like you're, you're feeling in your glutes, but what's actually mm -hmm. happening there. Can you just like talk us through that a little bit? Certainly. Uh, so within the sensation relative to, to true tension, this is going to be a challenging one for individuals who are just starting out or at a very early time within their uh, training career, if you will. And so when we look at the sensation relative to the tension, we have to understand that they're going to be supporting uh, muscle groups that are going to uh, be working when we're doing these different movements and things of that nature. So when we look at some of the examples that you brought up with the, the band around the knees and then the, uh, the abduction machine is that within those pieces specifically, we're going to have a very small muscle group under the glute called the piriformis. This is a, a muscle that does not need a, a ton of tension, but is going to uh, play a big role in the external rotation of at the hip specifically. So within the, within the band around the knees and the um, abduction machine, within those two specifically, they're going to create a whole lot of tension and inflammation specifically to that little bitty muscle group, that piriformis that runs under the glute max and the glute med specifically. And so you're going to get a lot of sensation that you're having. Oh my gosh, I'm having this, this pump and this, um, tension being created into my glutes. But when, in reality, it's going to be that piriformis, like, Hey man, this is not a, a kind of a, a safe place for us to be, uh, working. This is going to be more of an, an alarm to the, the body that, Hey, this is, this is, uh, causing me discomfort or what have you. And it's an injury that many individuals that power lifters that I work with, um, that they experience that perform sumo deadlifts to where they've been, uh, like when they come to, to work with us, I find them in a position where they have a lot of piriformis, uh, discomfort or, or strain because of that external rotation that the sumo has put them into, uh, where within the sumo deadlift, that's another example where we teach it in a different facet to where the positioning is more of a a wider stance squat, if you will, but it does eliminate a little bit of that range of motion. And we can still get a little bit of uh, glute max uh, tension relative to kind of what the sumo deadlift is, is made out to be is that you want to be as wide as possible, your feet touching the plates on that barbell so that you can eliminate as much range of motion as possible. And if you're competing in a sport like powerlifting, where you're trying to get a load as, as heavy as possible and move it from point A to point B, performing a movement in that manner makes total sense. But if we are in a context of 
wanting to put on as much muscle tissue as possible. We don't want to eliminate the entire range of motion. We want to put ourselves in an opportune position to create as much tension as possible. So that's what the, you know, sumo deadlift is going to be one where people really are like, you should never do this. And it's like, it's, it's not this cut and dry thing. It's going to be a, a setting it up for whatever goals that you have. Um, and so that's going to kind of play into the sensation over tension uh, component of things where you're going to have supporting muscle groups that are going to play a large role that could influence from a sensation or our mental perspective that you're getting all this tension. But the reality is, is that you've got some of these little bitty tissue uh, or muscle groups that you're not familiar with that are stabilizing a whole hell of a lot that are just not actually the tissue that you think you're training. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and I guess that would kind of like extra exercise execution and exercise selection for the individual, like those kind of go hand in hand in terms of like the importance, would you say? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, um, within the exercise selection, it's going to be something where, um, it's just dependent obviously on what's available to them, but also whatever the goals are and what they can execute well. So then you're looking through uh, videos and those different things to make sure that everything is very crisp on that front and, um, those different factors. Yeah. For sure. And I like that you mentioned that too, because I think part of the exercise execution part is actually seeing yourself doing the movement, right? So like filming right. yourself and like getting into, um, you know, actually doing that. Cause I know like some people, I, I used to, it, when I first kind of transitioned from CrossFit and went back to like the Globo gym or whatever you want to call it, um, I would see people filming themselves and like, oh, they're just doing this for Instagram. Like they're trying to like get selfie yeah. videos or whatever. And then I was like, yeah. wait, like they're, Maybe some of them are, but like some of them are, are like filming themselves to look and see how they're executing. You, you don't know unless you can go back and look at that. So I know obviously that's what we do every single week. I send exactly. you videos of my form. Yeah. Um, and so and getting feedback on that is super important, working with a coach in that regard. So awesome. Cool. Okay. So we got through one. <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes later. Um, all right. So the next one uh, we have on the list is periodized training um, and then kind of hand in hand with the progressive overload of the stimulus. So can you chat about that one as an important factor? Yeah, I think that when I was uh, a couple of different components that I have written down for this is that um, I, I think that Instagram is moving away from this, but it was for a, a good duration of time that the swipe workouts and those different mm -hmm. things being a very big piece of, of, uh, just content. And so I would see, or, or have clients or new clients come to us and, and find that they were really just like following some of their favorite influencers. And then they were just utilizing the workout that they had just posted on a regular basis. And, and oftentimes those accounts were not posting obviously the same session week after week, it was this new content that they were getting saves on and all that stuff. So in that those individuals were not really progressing. They were just being given a new stimulus each time of this, uh, like novelty of new exercises and new rep schemes and, and rest periods and those different factors to where they weren't really progressing. They were having fun because it was new and they were trying these different things, but there was no real way to track the progression or really see any progression because they're just getting this new thing that they're just, you know, trying to figure out as they go during that session. So within that, the, the periodization aspect is just picking exercises that are going to uh, maneuver the, or target the tissue that you're wanting to train, but then sticking with those exercises from a very just base level of things. If you're not wanting to work with a coach or get into uh, greater education on, on program design and those different factors, if you can select exercises and have an understanding of what those exercises are doing specifically and kind of selecting maybe four to six exercises and getting really good at those, especially early on, you're going to uh, benefit greatly. And when I say four to six exercises, thinking that per session. So if you're training maybe four days a week, maybe you're doing an upper lower type training and, and following those uh, movements for maybe you know, six to eight weeks and seeing how you progress, utilizing a log book, whether you utilize your notes app on your, on your phone, or you're actually writing it down, um, just to give yourself some understanding of how you're progressing, because you're not going to be able to, if you just, you know, train for eight weeks, and then you look back and you don't have, you don't have pictures, you don't have uh, a training journal to look at. There's not a whole lot of data for you to see, okay, how am I progressing rather than you just like looking in the mirror uh, each day when you wake up and being like, nope, I don't see it. It's very hard to see it for yourself anyway. And so having a structured plan in place, whether that be 
purchasing, uh, or, you know, working with a coach is going to be your, your top tier option there. And then utilizing maybe their one-off programs, or if they have like a, an app that they utilize, um, those options are going to be there, but having a regimented plan in place for you, um, is going to be the best way to one track progress and also to have progress in general, because, um, I know that there are individuals out there who have been training hard in their, uh, you know, to their standard for a year. And they've just kind of been, you know, bouncing in and out of the gym. I, I, I trained chest yesterday. They go into the gym the next day of like, mm, what's, what's not sore. I could hit this. And then they kind of just, uh, go through the motions on that front and find themselves a year later, they look very similar from a musculature perspective and they're not progressing a whole lot. And so that's a very defeating place to be. I, I don't want to be able, I don't want to be in a position where I've spent all this time over the past year and then get to the end and be like, dang, I haven't, there's nothing that's changed. I could have just done the same. I could have not gone and looked the same potentially. That would be very disheartening. And so being in a position where you have a plan in place, I think is going to be immensely helpful um, and just gratifying when you get to that year marker or whatever your, your, your standard for time is, is that you're going to be much more proud of yourself for having that plan in place and following that. Um, and it's, it's momentum. I, I think that that's also a big piece of the puzzle where having the plan and having the discipline to follow the plan, it creates a lot of momentum, not only in your training, but also is going to build momentum out and into your personal life within the disciplinary things that you've got to do with work and those different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think one of the biggest pieces of that too, especially if we're kind of going back to the main, uh, main overarching topic of females building muscle. And like, if someone's going into, if a female is going into a building phase, right. And, you know, within that, you're going to be, you're not going to be seen, you know, versus going to a fat loss phase where you'd be seeing body composition changes kind of happening right. relatively quickly compared to a building phase. Your only kind of gauge of not only, but one of the main gauges of your progress, like if you're actually putting on muscle tissue versus putting on body fat is going to be your progressions, you know, week, week to week, biweekly, monthly within your logbook. And so if you have no you know, no way to track that, no way to see if you're progressing throughout those movements, then you, how, how do you know that you're actually putting on muscle? Right. So that's like one of the biggest things. And like when I take, and I'm, I know you do too, but when I take clients through a building phase, it's going to be like the main thing that we're really focusing on is like, okay, let's, let's see you getting stronger over time. Cause that's going to correlate with obviously building muscle. Um, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that <laughs> the thing to circle back, cause I kind of got off on a side tangent of just like following a training program in general, but in the sense of, of what you're speaking to within or the greater topic of, of putting on muscle for, for women is that I think that uh, the other aspect is that that is one of the bigger discouraging pieces when uh, women go through the uh, muscle building phase is that they don't have the plan in place. So it can become discouraging very quickly. If you're only looking at physique photos that are not going to change a ton from a week to week perspective, they're going to change from a month to month perspective. That's where you want to see the shift and even greater shifts from like a, a three month window to a six month window and so on and so forth. Um, but if you're not utilizing the training as kind of your big driver of progression, it can become very, um, unsatisfactory or, mm -hmm. um, whatever the, the term would be there, it's going to be very short lived. You're going to be craving the opportunity to get back into that dieting phase so that you have kind of that, uh, goal out in front of you relative to in the improvement season or in a time where you're wanting to put on muscle tissue, you're in a position where it's just longer and you've got to be very, uh, just you're depositing pennies every day, um, relative to where, when you're in a dieting phase, it kind of feels like you're depositing quarters or dollars because it just moves you know, quicker. Um, so that would be kind of a, a key point as well. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes sense. And it's something that, uh, we have to continuously remind ourselves of like when we're talking about these different phases, whether it's a muscle building phase versus a fat loss phase, fat loss tends to be a lot quicker versus building muscle. Um, it's just like a much longer process. And I guess that brings us to the next topic, which is time and patience. Um, yeah. So this feeds into it very well. Did you have anything else you wanted to talk about? With the... I don't think so. Okay. We can always circle yeah. back. But in terms of time, um, you, you said time. I added patience along with this because I think that they go hand yeah. in hand, especially with <laughs> um, building muscle. Can So can we chat? Maybe we can start off by chatting about like, why it's such a long, it's so much longer of a process to 
put on muscle tissue and to build muscle than it is um, to, to lose body fat. Yeah. So within putting on muscle tissue, it is going to be a very luxury process for the body to, uh, to perform. It's, it's not a necessity. You're creating the necessity through your resistance training of putting it under a, a heavy stimulus on a daily or, you know, a weekly basis, if you will, to where it's like, Hey, I, I, I want to have this tissue. I have these processes that are going to transpire within my resistance training that I need that tissue. And once that stimulus is out, as many of you know, the followers have, our listeners have uh, potentially experienced, once the training is, is uh, no longer transpiring, that tissue starts to dwindle a little bit. It starts to, you know, we don't need it any longer. We've got other processes that we want to focus on. So that process comparatively to the, the body fat component, where if we're in a caloric deficit, that process is going to move a little bit faster of like, okay, well, I have all this, the, the body is thinking, I have all this excess fuel in terms of body fat. I'll break this down and use this as energy. So it's a little bit of a faster process, um, relative to putting on the muscle tissue of like, and eh, we don't really like need to do this, but you're really making us do this. So we're going to have to you know, figure out a way. And so in that giving yourself adequate time of, of truly being consistent and having that patience is going to be paramount for you. And it's not going to be, let's say that you go through a dieting phase that's 12 weeks long, maybe. And if you try to go through a period of time where you're putting on muscle for 12 weeks, it's not going to reap you the same benefit. You're not going to see this massive surge in muscle tissue. Um, and in, in that 12 weeks, not to even consider the reverse diet that you would probably have to do following that dieting phase to where you're just getting calories, even into a place to where you're in an opportune position to put on muscle tissue. So understanding those components is that it's just going to be such a time game. And, um, the, the patience comes through experience more so like, you're not just going to walk into that experience having the, just this utmost patience of being able to put on that muscle. It's going to be more of, you know, you're developing that as the, the process goes on. And the more time that you go through dieting phases and muscle building phases, the more patience you're going to build and understanding within that through the experience as a whole. Um, so that's mm -hmm. the, I guess the base of it, if we want to kind of rift off with questions and thoughts there. Yeah. Do you, what would be like the minimum that you would, if you were actively putting someone into a building phase, what's like the minimum amount of time that you, that you would want them to be there for? I would say the minimum would be like four months would be the, the bottom threshold. Uh, just because I have, uh, I have good faith in terms of the, the service and, and just what my, like, if I was working with an individual, I would say four months and that would be in the thought process of, okay, we're being very consistent on a day-to-day -day basis. We're tracking the correct variables. Sleep has been good. All the biofeedback markers are good in the context of the individual who is doing this on their own and just being brutally honest with yourself, whenever you're analyzing how things are going for yourself, I would lend closer to that five to six month marker to allow for a little bit of, of greater variance and allowing for you to be in, in a more flexible state just from a, a lifestyle you know, perspective as a whole. So I would say five to six months would be a good time frame for you to analyze things. And, and this is also going to be dependent on where your body fat levels are at as well. Mm -hmm. Like when you're playing this time game, if you have accumulated too much body fat, you've pushed the boundaries too far from a body fat perspective, it may be in your best interest to get into a dieting phase for a short period of time to be in an opportune position to actually put on that muscle tissue, because there is going to be diminishing returns, um, from a, a total body fat perspective off the top of my head. I cannot think of what that, um, percentage is going to be for male and female. Um, maybe it'll hit me as we continue to talk here. Um, but Are there is a threshold the ratio partitioning. Ratio? Can't think. Um, I don't know. It may come to me. I I'm, I'm totally right. blanking on it. It doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not overly necessary. I suppose to be like, uh, super duper accurate on that, but, um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Would you say that like, cause this kind of floats around a little bit like the rate of gain when you go into a muscle mm -hmm. building phase, like what you should be focused on in, in terms of the amount um, that you want to quote unquote gain on, on the scale, obviously um, throughout a period of months or do you have anything that you look for in rate of gain for 
you know, a client or is it more so just based off of the individual and, and kind of how they're progressing and all the other different factors? Yeah, I would say it's very individual on that. Um, I wish that I had kind of a, a base thing to recommend in terms of the, the weight um, kind of window. Um, puppy dogs going crazy. I don't know if you guys can hear that audio at all. Um, no <laughs> so, it happens um, all the time here. <laughs> Oh, this startled me. Uh, but with with the things that I would encourage the the listeners to focus on from a time perspective is that um, how is your digestion? How is your your training going? What is your energy like throughout the day? Um, and then like the, just the the main biofeedback markers that you would be taking into consideration and paying very close attention to pictures, uh, because the 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 amount, the scale of option is going to vary so much from person to person in terms of how quickly they uh, add scale weight or the difference in terms of what their cycle does to their scale weight. So I don't want that to skew individuals where it's like, oh my gosh, my, my scale weights up four pounds during my cycle here. I, 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 have overdone it where in reality, it's just this fluid or tension that needs to be corrected, um, potentially from electrolytes or stress or what have you. And so when we're looking at it, taking the biofeedback markers and paying attention to the physique photos, the training and those things are going to be much more important than getting married to this window of weight that you should be putting on, uh, from month to month, uh, throughout the, uh, growth phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's super important, especially when we're talking about females, because, Mm -hmm. you know, there's some people who say like, and and the reason I ask the rate of gain question is because sometimes uh, people refer to like a specific percentage, depending on like, you know, how um, advanced you are within your training age, like what you should Mm -hmm. be focusing on in terms of rate of gain per week. But I haven't really found any validity behind the weekly increases, because especially as a female, like you said, you could gain four pounds and one on your weekly average weight because you were up a few pounds during your cycle um, or right. the many other reasons why the scale fluctuates. And I think that that is something that can be, uh, you know, just very scary if you're looking at just the scale. Right. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. And I was just saying also there could be like a delay in terms of like when you're in the, the building phase. I know for me, when I went through my eight month building phase, however long ago that was like, I, I tended to see the scale kind of catch up um, mm-hmm. after a certain period of time. Like there wouldn't be much, like there'd be daily fluctuations, things like that. But then like kind of all of a sudden it was like three weeks, I look back and it's like, okay, now I'm like caught up to the rate of gain that I was like looking to be within, within what my kind of old coach was was referencing. Um, it was mm-hmm. just one marker obviously, but th- there can be a delay in that um, month to month or even like bi-monthly. So I think that's a, a important factor, but yeah, what were you going to say? I, I was just more so saying that I, I feel as though when I put the reference points in terms of how much weight should be gained from a week to week or month to month perspective, it just adds this extra stress that isn't overly necessary for the the client to have, where if they see that scale, you know, exceeding whatever that limit was that we put into place, it very well may not be a big deal. Like it very well could be okay. It's just that by the, by the standard or by the numbers, it's, they're kind of an outlier on whatever the, the metric is. Um, and so I've, I've found it in, in my experience more so lending away from the scale provided that it's not getting out of hand, of course, um, in a growth phase is a time where we can take a little bit of time away from the scale and focus very heavily on the physique photos, the biofeedback markers that I spoke on. Um, and I think that it helps a ton from a mental health perspective for the females that I, I work with, because the scale can be such a place of, of negativity. It's very tough to um, have that scale in from a day-to-day perspective and see it going in a fashion that you're just not comfortable with and getting into those uncomfortable components. Now, it may very well be a thing that uh, individuals are growing from in terms of pushing through and pushing through that uh, discomfort to find themselves into a better position. I do think that that's possible. Um, But for some individuals, it's just, it's not something that's even worth the, um, 
the struggle of, of it and just mm-hmm. kind of staying away from it and putting them into a better place where they are feeling. Cause like sometimes when individuals get on that scale, that starts their day in a negative sense. And then all of a sudden their clothes don't look great on them, not because of it, not actually looking good on them, just because of that number on the scale. And then it just carries kind of throughout their day. And it's like, yeah. man, this, this little piece of metal is really affecting your day that much. It, it, that, that is uh, obviously not worth it. And we can utilize so many other tools to put you into a better place um, and still have great success, like with, with or without mm-hmm. that scale. So that's the, the, the main reason for me of, of not being so honed in on the scale as a whole. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think also like even for myself, just knowing like over the past years, like why the scale fluctuates daily, knowing that and like reminding myself of that all the time, I still get in my head sometimes, like if I see a spike and that's just normal, right? That's normal part of being a a human being. (laughs) Um, so that in in itself, and especially if you're, you're not aware of like, I, I, and I know you do too, kind of explain at least for me on a weekly basis to my clients, why that scale is fluctuating based off of different factors, even doing that, like on a weekly basis, week after week after week, like I continuously sometimes forget. Right. Um, so I think that's super important. Have you ever, and this is just a quick question before we get into the the next, the last two, um, do you ever utilize a Bluetooth scale with clients at all where you can like track your Mm. weight and not even look at it on a daily basis? Yeah, I have utilized that. I think that for in the context of, of clients with myself is that I will use that more so in prep where we've maybe hit a, a plateau or really challenging point into their um, contest prep to where in that con in that where it's like it does help me a good bit to understand how the body's responding, but it's not doing anything for their mental health. I'll utilize that and then just have that kind of report to me. Like the, the one that's coming to mind right now is the Fitbit one. Um, so that was like sending me, it would like fill out the, it would fill out her tracker or whatever. I don't know how it all worked, but anyway, it got set up and it was in a fashion to where she just got on there and then the app kind of did all the stuff that it needed to do um, without her having to pay a whole lot of attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is something that I, I, I got a Bluetooth scale like a while back. I haven't utilized that myself yet, but it is something that potentially just having the, the data there and not looking on a daily basis that's something that I want to utilize myself. Could be helpful. Yeah. It's something I've done with a few clients where they basically just put a piece of tape over the, the reader, like the, where the number pops out and it just goes right to their phone. Like it, they count five seconds and the, the reading goes to their app on their phone. And then at the end of the week, when they go to fill in their tracker, instead of filling in the, like every single day, they just go back and look at their seven days and they fill it in and it shows them like the fluctuations and then the average at the Mm. end. Um, that's something just, if you are someone who is struggling with like the mental side of things, which we all do, it can be like a, a cool thing to see, like how much your, your daily fluctuations happen. And then you yeah. kind of look at the weekly average and you're like, like, for example, if you're in a, a maintenance, like if you're just practicing maintenance, like seeing that it could have gone up and down like two to three pounds. Right. But you're still like at that, that weekly average, which, um, matters most, right. The, the trends right. over time. So cool. Awesome. All right. This Second to last one, um, and we kind of talked about this a little bit uh, when we started auditing social media outlets um, and using like why that could be something that's beneficial, you know, from a mental standpoint, especially in a building phase for a female. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is this is massive. I feel like this is something <laughs> that <laughs> this is something that, especially through quarantine and mm-hmm. uh, just what this last year has brought a lot of us in terms of more time on our phone in general um, and more time in social media outlets. Uh, This has been something that we've really had to drive home. So uh, within building phases specifically, it's very easy to get caught up on your explore page or individuals that you follow that maybe these individuals are just um, beautiful human beings. And then also they are posting content that is uh, very well edited as well as potentially only posting content when they're very lean uh, or photos from when they were very lean. They may not be very lean in that moment. And and I may be blowing some individuals' minds who are listening right now that they thought that some of these people are just lean 24 seven and 365 days a year. Um, 99% probably not the case. And so within that, find yourself or understand that you need to audit your, uh, 
the accounts that you're following when you're going through this phase where you're already going to be in an uncomfortable position by pushing into a little bit of greater body fat than maybe what you're comfortable with. And then adding on top of that, seeing individuals who you may look up to or um, find yourself in a comparison state within individuals on Instagram, where it's already a highlight reel with edited photos. And it's the perfect angle for this person. They probably took a hundred pictures to get to that one. And you're finding yourself in this position where you're comparing your glimpse that you caught in, in your hallway mirror of yourself, not a great angle, right? And then you're comparing it to what this you know, individual that you saw on Instagram, this beautifully edited photo that, that you know, there's many options of that. And that's that specific one. And then you're in this comparison game of like, oh, I should get into a dieting phase because mm -hmm. oft, oftentimes that's the biggest driver that I see within uh, clients from a lifestyle, from a competition prep, all those things. They see things on social media and they're like, dang, like I, I should do that. Like, I want to look like that. And I need to get into a dieting phase today. And it's just like, it, it, it's not a, a good outlet for you. And kind of just making sure that as you're analyzing those things that you're paying attention to some of those cues, um, that may come up. Yeah, that is, I think that's a huge one. It's something that we don't really think about as part of kind of the whole process and like looking at other people and, you know, kind of wishing you look that way or whatever it may be. And it, it can be like a huge, just like the scale, it's just like a huge mental hurdle. So I love that one. I don't have any questions about that one, but I think it was a really, okay. really good point. Important piece, <laughs> um, yeah. I know for me too, like I, again, I consistently have to remind myself, like people who are posting, they don't look like this 24 seven, like maybe 1% of them, like you said, who have like the best genetics in the world and they can just maintain a super lean photo shoot ready physique all year round. That's like, barely anybody, but there are some people out there. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I like that one. Um, okay. So the last one, life outside of training and balance. So I, I think that this is another big piece that cuts the growth phase short for many individuals is that, uh, they feel as though when they get into the muscle building component of things, that they just, they kind of have to turn things off and, and the, the tracking of everything that we've kind of talked on throughout these two episodes to where it's like, if I'm going to prioritize all those things and make sure that everything is hundred percent, how am I going to still go out with my friends and, and go out with my, my boyfriend or, or spouse or what have you, uh, and, and still enjoy those things while also maximizing the, um, you know, progress that I want to make from a muscle building perspective. And so I think that it is an important piece to kind of look at this from the, the top point being your adherence. So if whatever the plan is that you're uh, curating for yourself, the adherence is going to be the number one. If you can't adhere, then it's not worth your time to go through and construct. So finding like going through your priorities and understanding, okay, spending time with my spouse is, is number one, spending time with my friends and family is number two, and those different things. And understand that those things need to still transpire just as you normally would. And then making the tracking of your food, getting your training sessions in, getting your cardio done, whatever you're doing, um, a part of that and making it a part of your lifestyle rather than trying to um, mute the other aspects of your life to focus solely on this, because it's one, it's not going to be sustainable in that fashion. You're going to kind of seclude yourself from, from everyone around you, if you will, to, and, and, uh, that's not a, a place to be, nor a place that you, uh, will enjoy once you get there. And, um, it's just going to be more sustainable for you. Like I said, adherence is going to be top tier at that point when you're able to have that balance of, of still being able to spend time with your friends, family, those different factors uh, throughout the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I think, do you feel like, I, I think this is one of the, the mistakes that I've seen and, and kind of made myself to in previous times when I tried to go into a building phase and then kind of was like, oh, I'm feeling fluffy two months later. So I'm going to go back into that. <laughs> um, that's where like the yo-yo coming in and all that. And that was obviously before um, this previous building phase that I was that I was mentioning where I went through it with a coach and had someone um, there to kind of help me through it. But in that regard, do you feel like some people, you know, kind of feel like it can be kind of a free for all where they're, they actually stop tracking and they start to maybe consume a little bit too much then you know then what the what it would be on the plan and then they kind of get to a point where it's like i said like two or three months in they're like oh man i'm way 
I put on way too much and I just need to go back into that dieting phase and it kind of come, becomes this yo-yoing effect because they actually didn't put the time in and the effort to actually track what they were doing. Um, do you see that happening or can you kind of talk to that a little bit? Very much so. I think that um, within the, the growth phases, many individuals are just going to think, okay, greater calories equates to me gaining muscle. And, and the, the fact of the matter is that that is not the case. And I think that more commonly is that individuals will have poor appetite because of the poor nutrients that they're taking in. So it's kind of this like wavering aspect of like, okay, well, we went out to dinner, we had drinks and we, you know, came home super late and had, um, McDonald's or something of that nature. So there's a big bolus of calories at this time of night, and then you're not hungry the next day. And so it's this big fluctuation of overall calories to where within the balance that you can create by being more consistent throughout the week, um, you can still have that freedom on the weekends to spend time with your friends and, and whatnot. Uh, but I think that having the structure and, and one thing that I one thing that I consistently say is that discipline is leads to, to freedom or discipline leads to um, just the, the abundance of being able to do what you want to do. So utilizing that discipline throughout the week and, and throughout the weekend too, it's not like five days on two days of going uh, balls to the wall type situation. It's going to be that the discipline throughout is going to give you one better results, of course, but also be able to sustain that, that mix of balance of, of freedom within the, uh, components of still seeing the progress with the goals that you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like how you put that having, you know, more discipline is it's obviously discipline is important, but especially, you know, like I said, people kind of think that you have because maybe you have some more calories to work with that you have obviously you have a little bit more flexibility and I kind of like to refer to it as you, yes you will have more flexibility just due to the fact that you have more food to consume but it's that plan flexibility that is where the the magic happens so planning for you know the weekend right if you're in mm -hmm. your zone in the week um, and you want to like go out and have a, a meal you know like for myself on Saturdays, I typically always go out to a restaurant. So I try to allocate, you know, a bit more calories on Saturday and pull back a little bit when I'm, you know, not doing much, whatever. Um, so just kind of having that plan flexibility versus going into it and being like, oh, I can just, you know, be dialed in during the week and then just kind of go all out on the weekend and then kind of think, you know, <laughs> things start to start to accumulate over time. And you're like, oh, man, that probably shouldn't have done that. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's, that's a big piece of it as well. Um, with this, I do want to ask one more kind of, cause I have a bonus here and this is a shameless plug for both of us. <laughs> um, but okay. in terms of for females specifically, you know, putting on muscle going potentially through a building phase, or even, you know, if you are newer, like going through a maintenance phase and, potentially in a slight surplus and you are really focused on spending time building muscle and, and not spending time in a deficit, the importance of having someone to guide you along the way. So having a coach throughout that process, um, for me specifically, I think throughout my last building phase, which was about eight months long, like if I didn't have someone to check in with every single week, if I didn't have someone to kind of get my, get me out of my own head, I would not have probably made it past two or three months. Um, so like I said, shameless plug for both of us, for both coaches, but where do you like for yourself, do you utilize a coach? Do you like, what's the, what do you find is like the biggest piece of having a coach that is important, especially if we're looking at the building side of things versus like the fat loss side of things. That was kind of a confusing, confusing question, but no, I think, yeah, <laughs> do your it best. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a coach myself. I've had a, a coach myself for the majority of time that I've, I've coached, um, as well. So I, we've, I've had the, the online business for eight years and I would say I've had a coach for probably six of those, like, uh, not continuous, but, uh, you know, throughout that whole process, I want to say of that probably six years of that. And, and really the, the other two that I didn't have a coach myself was because I just plain didn't have the money to, um, have the coach probably at the time. And so within the, the 
the coach aspect for me personally, it is the accountability component of things, the learning uh, aspects so the accountability and the learning is the, the two big portions for me. And then it, through specifically a, a growth phase, this is a time where um, if I was to be one selecting the movements that I would be training, I would probably be picking some muscle groups that I've already are some of my stronger muscle groups. And then now I'd be creating a greater imbalance between the remainder of my physique of like, and these were things that I was lagging in. These are the things that I was not good at. And I should have been focusing on through this growth phase, but I was writing this for myself. And I want to be happy every time I leave for my, leave my training sessions of how great I was within X, Y, and Z. And so that is the challenging component where I am put into situations where, uh, I, you know, movements and muscle groups that are not my strong suit, and I'm, I'm working to get those things improved. Those are things that I wouldn't program for myself. So that's one big positive for me as well. And then just the accountability to eat the quantity of calories that it takes to get to that growth, because it would be very easy for me to just eat at a, uh, you know, below maintenance where I'm, I'm, I go on my walks and I, I hit my steps and those different things, but I'm sitting at this desk a, a large majority of my day. And so it'd be very easy for me just to miss a meal here and miss a meal here and, and just get in kind of the base amount of calories that I would really need. And to not, you know, I wouldn't see that growth that I want because I would very easily just be like, ah, you know, today is today. And, and those different factors. Whereas if I get to that check-in and, and my coach's name is Adam. And so if I got to that check-in, he would call me out and, and give me a hard time for sure for not um, adhering to what the protocols were that were in place. So I think there's a, a very large benefit to having the coach there because you can get very, you can let some things slip when you're doing things yourself as um, being, being self-motivated as, as well as self-disciplined on a daily basis, not the easiest thing. But as soon as you put in that variable of, okay, I have someone that I look up to, I have someone that, um, yeah, I respect and those different factors and I want to make them proud, those things you have those in, in, in place. I think that that's a, a big driver for you, even on the days that you're not self-motivated and you're not feeling overly self-disciplined, um, that you're going to be able to push through rather than on the days that you don't have that in place. And you're going to probably let some things slip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I think like exactly what you said, the accountability factor in itself is just like, for me, that's like the most important thing. If I didn't have Huge. someone to someone you to check into every <laughs> single week I would probably just make all the excuses in the world to do something or not do something or whatever it may be so that is that is huge and I think one of the other components of like hiring a coach and you know back when I first started off and first started hiring my own coach it took me a little time to kind of think about you know putting the money into this type of you know investment because it's not something that's like tangible it's not like you're buying a car or you're buying uh, I don't know, groceries for the week. It's not like physical. And I think that is something that takes a little bit of like, okay, thinking about, all right, what are you, what are you spending your money on? You're spending your money on investing in yourself. And like, if you want to see changes happen, like there is, if you've been doing it, doing it your own, on your own and just continuing to spin your wheels. I know that's what happened for me when I first hired my, my first coach, it was, I was doing things and even being a nutritionist myself, I was just not one, I didn't have the accountability Two, I was just spinning my wheels. I wasn't, I didn't have any like outside perspective to kind of like, you know, hone in on certain things. And I think that was like the biggest piece for me is just having someone else kind of get me out of my own head. And also like the training aspect of it, having someone else write my program just completely changed it. Cause like you said, when you're, if you're trying to write your own program or you're trying to follow some swipe workout on Instagram, like it's, Typically, like maybe you'll see some progress in the beginning, but it's just going to be short lived and you're just going to probably end up wasting your time um, for what you could actually be doing if you, you know, invested in that. So anyway, I'm going to stop, <laughs> stop, talk, stop pitching us because we are both coaches. But <laughs> if you are listening to this and you're like, oh, that's me, like I need help. Obviously, both Alex and I um, do this for a living. So Absolutely. reach out to, to either of us. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the, the bonus. So just to kind of go through all the things that we talked about, I'll just, I have them on my notes here. Um, if you're listening to part two, which is right now, and you haven't listened to part one yet, definitely go back and check that one out. Uh, we chatted all about Alex. We started off with his intro. So if you are listening to this and you don't know who Alex is, definitely go back and uh, listen to that one. Um, 
we can hear his background and how, you know, he got into where he is today. Um, and then we also talked about calorie surplus, um, the importance of that, importance of sleep and recovery, dove into different aspects of that, and then also dove into hormonal health. And I asked a lot of questions um, in that regard. And then today we went through exercise execution, periodizing training, um, time and patience, the importance of that, importance of auditing social media outlets, and then life outside of training, as well as um, the importance of having a coach to guide you along the way. So. Anyway, do you have anything else you wanna you wanna add or finish off? I feel like I kept this to under mm. an hour, which is awesome. <laughs> I know. I thought we crushed today. I thought we yeah. uh, were much more concise than we were in uh, episode one or part one. Yeah, um, one. yeah I, I think that this was uh, very helpful. I think that there was a lot of just valuable information that we shared as a whole. I do hope that the listeners um, felt like they got a lot out of it. We're able to take notes and those different factors, but I don't have anything else to, to add. Thank you for, for having me for both part one and part two. Um, it, I think that, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Thanks for, for the time. Um, so do you want to just tell everybody where they can find you, your sure. uh, website, podcasts, social media? Lots of stuff. Okay. So, um, you can find me on Instagram at Alex Bush, uh, B U S H with a, with two underscores on, on Instagram. And then, uh, the coaching service is physique development underscore on Instagram. We have our podcast, which Rachel reminded me that I have a podcast <laughs> on the, <laughs> on part one. Um, but that is the, uh, physique development podcast there. And then we have the physique development training club, which is our app. That is a monthly subscription. That is just a training written for you. Um, and then we have our website, which is just physique development.com very on brand with things, as you can see, um, <laughs> I think awesome. that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Cool. Well, I will absolutely link everything in the show notes. Um, yeah, this is fun. I'm sure I'll, I'll want to have you back on in the future for another topic. Uh, I feel like there's so many different absolutely. topics we could uh, dive into and I could grill you on questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I will talk to you soon. All right. See you. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Metflex and Chill. I hope you enjoyed it. It would be awesome if you could give the show five stars and leave a review on iTunes. We're trying to get placed in the top 100 health podcasts, and the five-star ratings and reviews are what can help make that happen. I'll add step-by-step -step directions for leaving a review in the show notes. I know it's a big ask, but it really helps. Thanks again. See you next time.